Okay, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us here on um, one of the Working Options Masterclass. Um, my name's Claire, Claire McMaster. I'm Head of Programme here at Working Options. Um, and as a charity, we provide young people with a variety of interactions with employers to um, potentially develop their employability skills um, and actually you know, provide that valuable um, opportunity to hear about all the different um, routes and opportunities that are available in various sectors. And we share um, key insights with our volunteers who come along and really give us a great indication of the opportunities that are out there for young people who are currently transferring from the world of education into the world of work. Um, and today is a great opportunity for everyone who's joined us to hear about um, potential next steps and just about those key things that are actually going on around the food industry today. So the session is being recorded, so you will receive a recording of um, what you hear and see today for future reference. And anyone who wasn't able to join the call um, will be able to pick up the key details from the recording. Um, and today I am delighted to be joined by Kate and her colleagues from a variety of organisations. We have Veris, um, we have Greencore, Cranswick, um, Ellis Kitchen, Future Food Movement. And they are going to, on our behalf, share a huge insight into how you can really make a difference by the choices that you make and the next steps that you consider. Um, at the end of the um, call today, there will be a survey where we'll get your valuable feedback that will really help us progress in our presentation and pick up some key things that you would also like to continue to find out about. Um, and also please take the opportunity today to ask any questions at all that you feel are relevant or you want to find out more about. Um, everyone on the call today is very willing and up and ready to answer any queries that come in. So please use the chat facility for that. Um, but for now, I shall hand over to Kate and Kate will take the session away. So very warm welcome, Kate. Lovely. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, really looking forward to this. Um, as Claire said, I'm Kate and I'm hosting today's masterclass with um, some really brilliant um, guests who not only work um, and produce incredible food for the world for us all to eat, but they're absolutely climate rock stars at the same time. So today's session is about kind of looking at a career in the food industry, but perhaps considering it with um, a different lens. And actually a reason beyond the obvious in that a job in food can help tackle some of the biggest environmental and social challenges that we face today. And there is no greater industry that I think can have such a positive impact because everybody um, has to eat. So today is all about how a job in food can be part of the climate solution. Um, and I'm really looking forward to like finding out more about um, the guys in the room with their careers and how they put kind of climate front and centre with what they're doing. Um, but the kind of call to action is that we really need more change makers to join us to make this happen. Because, you know, to quote the almighty David Attenborough, right now we're facing a man-made disaster of a global scale and it's our greatest threat in the thousands of years, which is climate change. So if that isn't a call to action, um, I don't know what is. So really quickly, just gonna do some intros. Um, we've got Carl, we've got Will, we've got Andy, all from very um, different food companies, very different roles, but all of them, as I said, are putting kind of climate front and center of what they do. Um, apart from Andy, who's got obviously sustainability in his job title, um, Carl and Will, you know, it's really interesting, I think, they very much kind of advocate, and, and actually Andy and I, with the role that I do, we need more people like Carl and Will, who are kind of leading sustainability and not leaving it to the sustainability professionals in the room. So really quickly, just to introduce myself, Veris and Future Food Movement. So we are, yeah, I'm the founder of Veris and Future Food Movement, and we're a sustainability and climate first consultancy, and we're all about helping the food industry become a positive force for good um, through strategy and impact. Uh, at the start of this year, we launched Future Food Movement, which is this new digital community uh, for the food industry for, you know, at any level from boardroom right through to kind of factory, farm level um, and retail uh, floor. Um, and it's all about kind of we really recognise that there is a big skills gap. Uh, which is causing a lack of confidence to take action. So what we're really trying to do is galvanise the industry to kind of provide a space to learn more, upskill, connect, and just really inspire action because that's what we need to see. So I'm going to hand over to Carl now, who can uh, introduce himself and also his business, Cranswick. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carl Mead, and I'm the managing director at Cranswick. Um, we are a food manufacturing business. If you look at the slide that Kate's has shown, it'll show a wide range of products that we produce. Um, we are quite diverse, although we were sort of founded back in the 1980s. Um, we have had to <clears throat> adapt very quickly. We've, we've sort of moved into um, from, from pork manufacturing into poultry and then latterly into uh, sort of the conti meat and then very latterly into pet food. So we are a diverse business and we, we get where we are at the moment. I'm currently responsible, responsible for three manufacturing facilities. Um, currently got 1,700 employees, currently turn over sort of 450 million on the sites I'm responsible for. Um, but yeah, I'll, um, I'll talk to you a little bit later about what we're doing on site and what, we have, uh, what we've achieved so far. Brilliant, lovely. Um, Will? Hi guys, my name's Will. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Ella's Kitchen. I would be called the Deputy Head of Ella's um, in our language. Um, we, Ella's Kitchen, to introduce them, uh, we're the number one baby food in the UK. We're sold in about 42 countries across the world from um, from Iceland through to China and Inner Mongolia for that. Um, we're a very active brand. We're a B Corp, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about B Corp and the importance of that later on. Um, and just to show you, we're a very active voice. Next week, in Tuesday, we're going to the Houses of Parliament to lobby government to make sure that um, we challenge the Food um, uh, Early Years Food Foundation and get some changes made there. So we're a small company with a massive voice. Um, and that makes life very fun. Love that. Andy? Hi, guys. Uh, I work for uh, a PLC called Greencore. We, uh, I think, are often budget as the um, the biggest company you've probably never heard of. So, um, like Carl, we're a, a UK food manufacturer. Uh, we don't operate many brands. Um, we mainly manufacture for UK supermarkets in the main. And um, we're the world's largest sandwich maker. Um, not as in one really massive sandwich, but like lots of sandwiches, if that helps. Brilliant, lovely, thank you. So yeah, really diverse mix, which is great. So it'll be a good conversation. And obviously when we open the questions up to the audience, like pretty sure there's no question these guys won't answer. So really quickly, um, I thought it might be useful just to connect the dots with why food and climate and why now. So fundamentally, time is running out. We've got eight years left before we reach climate change tipping point, uh, which is where it's going to be really hard to reverse the impact that we're kind of seeing. So it's very much about the climate and nature crisis that we're seeing. It's not tomorrow's problem. They're actually today's emergencies. And we really need to step up and tackle this because the climate crisis threatens the world's food supply. And if food businesses don't exact, adapt, indeed any business, they just won't exist in 2030. So why food? Um, just to really kind of top line, Kind of impact stats a quarter of all global emissions well carbon emissions come from food yet on the same time we've also got a big social impact we need to tackle as well in that 750 million people are going to bed every night hungry yet as a global society we keep wasting food we are making enough food but nearly 40 percent of the food we make is lost and then let's look at plastic waste, obviously something that, you know, really came to life with all of us with David Attenborough and the Blue Planet. You know, 11 million tonnes of plastic a year is entering the ocean. There's 300 million tonnes of plastic packaging produced and only 9% is currently recycled. Like the system is broken. We absolutely need to fix it. And then it, let's go back down to kind of animals, biodiversity, nature, kind of wildlife. These populations are down 79% in just 50 years. And the way that we grow and produce and manufacture and consume food is having a huge kind of detrimental effect. And it's actually one of the major causes of deforestation. But, and I'm an eternal optimist, and this is why it's such an exciting, I think, career option to consider food, in that I passionately believe, and, and the guys in the room, that food can absolutely fix the planet for us. And it isn't just, you know, us that kind of live and breathe this stuff. There was, you know, many of the world's leading scientists and, you know, just to quote the Eat Lancet report, which is a very credible report that came out in 2019, that food is the single strongest lever to optimise human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. So, again, you know, and, and this amazing quote, we're the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, but we're also the last generation that can do something about it. 
um, the impact that we can have within the food industry is really exponential. And I think it's incredibly inspiring to know we can make a difference, but we need the next generation to join us for this incredible career with impact. Um, and imagine being part of an industry that can help solve these big, wicked problems. So this is the kind of whole theme is that a job in food can absolutely be part of the climate solution. So I'm going to go to you, Andy, now, because I think you are a head of sustainability. You're a sustainability professional. So, and, and I know certainly in my role, and I'm sure you do, you get asked all the time, how do I get into sustainability? Um, so, yeah, what, what was your kind of career route and how did you end up in sustainability and how did you end up in food? So um, mine was a fairly boring traditional route. Um, so I did A-levels, I did a degree in, it wouldn't have been quite sustainability at the time, but it was uh, environmental management and it was really broad brush degree from kind of dry land degradation, degradation to Africa to water pollution to management systems and all sorts of different things. Philo I did a bit of philosophy as well, it was really diverse. Um, and always knew I wanted to work in that kind of field, I wanted a job with with purpose, basically, I wanted to to make a difference somehow. Um, and food kind of fell into my lap. So I I was a uh, went from university to become a, a consultant, which was that was the hardest move actually, the first one because how do you get a job without experience? Um, that was always the the catch. And I got really lucky. In I had a, a connection, a guy who I worked with who um, ran a consultancy and and gave me that opportunity. Um, and so I moved from um, consultancy into the food industry. And yeah, why the food industry? But you've, you've highlighted it really well. But, um, you know, we all eat. Food matters. Um, it's a really, really fast pace uh, place to work. The issues are multiple from a sustainability perspective and new issues um, are always coming over the horizon. So in terms of if you like change and you like fast pace, um, amazing place to work. Brilliant. How about you, Will? Yeah, I've I've sort of I didn't start out in food. I was I didn't follow the traditional route um, into employment. I went to two different colleges. I only managed to get to the fifth form in school. I wasn't necessarily allowed into the sixth form for various <laughs> reasons. But you know, everyone's allowed their own path in life, and yeah. I've definitely made mine. So my first, my, one of my first jobs was at L'Oreal, which was great. There was loads of billion dollar brands. And then at PepsiCo, again, very similar billion dollar brands. And I was really lucky to go and work at Red Bull, who were challenging the energy market at the time in energy drinks. Then I moved to Innocent and I really started to settle and enjoy food and drink. And now I've been at Ella's Kitchen for nearly nine years, which I never thought I'd ever say in a sentence, but I've been here for a long time. Um, and I truly believe we can do something different. Um, I can talk about the Ella's strategy that we've just signed off and started to share. But, you know, our belief is that every little one deserves to grow up happy, healthy and never hungry. And the three ways we're going to do that is we're going to double kids fruit and veg intake, halve our environmental impact and double the size of our company at the same time. And to double the size of our company means that we will have double the amount of money to invest in driving down our uh, impact on the climate and improving kids' lives. So there's a massive part we can play in everything by being a cool brand in a really cool sector. Yeah, and I love the fact how much you're kind of recognised using your voice and that, that influence you can have as well is huge. Um, Carl, how about you? How did you get into food? Um, I would say I got into food by accident, to be honest. I had <clears throat> I left school at sort of 16. Um, I did go to sixth form for a while, and if I was honest with you, I didn't didn't really enjoy it. I only had one real one real goal in life. I'd not really had an opportunity to travel much, so I, I thought, well, actually, I do want to travel. Um, so I went and worked in a, a local sort of food manufacturing facility and, and became a bit of a factory cat, actually. I, I sort of worked every hour was available, and that was probably long before working time directive was a was a thing so I, I managed to save quite a lot of money and then uh, took myself around the world for uh, the best part of 12 months actually went to Australia New Zealand Australia, spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia um, and sort of came back to the UK and, and wanted to get back into work 
Um, did I have a career path in mind? No, I didn't. But actually, I went back to the, the place where I started um, and just looked around. And so actually, you know, there's opportunities for people who are, who've got, who are bright, who've got common sense, um, who've got a bit of spark around them. And I was very fortunate to be, you know, recognising those, those, that site as somebody who had a bit of all those things put together. Um, and, and I've been fortunate to be some of the sites who invested heavily in my development and, and opportunity. So I spent sort of 10 years working my way from, from literally shop floor um, with zero qualifications in food, actually, to working up to sort of operations manager at the site where we were producing sort of 1,600 tonnes of retail product a week and, and supplying every sort of man here, every supermarket. Um, I spent three years away from that business and went and that's where I really got an opportunity to run a business. So I became a operations director for a, a German business, actually diversified slightly and, and went into a manufacturing in the UK. Um, and then I joined Cranswick, where I've been at Cranswick for the last six years. Um, and I spent sort of the last three years as a director and very latterly as a managing director. Um, I'm very fortunate to have the, the job I have. It's very influential around the sites. Um, we're, we've got some, some great people who, who want to do the best things. I think the opportunity I've got at, this site is to, at the sites I'm responsible for is certainly 80% of our staff live within 10 to 15 sort of minutes walking, riding, biking to, to work. Um, the opportunity we've got to, to put good back into the community is huge. Um, you know, from a social side, we want to, to put as much back. We want people to remember that, you know, we want us to look back and say, is this world better for having us in this in this world? And actually, we'd like to say it is. Um, and that's not from a, you know, we can we can spend as much money as we can. And we're fortunate that we're in, we can invest heavily in, in putting technologies into the factories to make them more effective and more efficient and take out some of the some of the carbon that we're putting in there. But actually, from a social element, we want the guys actually not just to see that. We want them to take that home and, and live and breathe the, the same language that we're talking at the minute. Yeah, that, and actually, you can answer this question, actually, that's, that's come in, is what sort of, as a managing director and, and under your sites, what sort of roles are there available? Oh, there's all, there's all you know, if you, if you were to start at the very beginning, you know, it, new products start with new product development, so that's people who've got nutritional uh, scientists, we've got, you know, every, every opportunity we've got, we've got factory workers. If I was to lift the lid on the, the site, we've got, we've got chemists in technical We've got engineering managers, we've got um, production, you know, the, the factory is such a small part of the business. Actually, when you open it up and say, what in these guys, we've got chefs who create the great food, great tastes. We've got, um, like I said, we've got MPD managers who get to spend an awful lot of time at the front end of the business. And actually, that's where the product starts now. And that's where we actually start talking about climate and understanding what's going to be the impact of that new product. And actually, we've never looked at it like that before. Yeah, that, and I'm going to go to you now, Andy, because um, in your role as sort of in-house, as the sustainability guru, the sustainability expert, with all those roles that um, Carl has just described, how, what's your advice and how do you work within your business to make sure they're putting climate front and centre of every decision? Yeah, so I suppose my job's a bit different in that, that... Um we're there to kind of bring it all together and to act as the independent experts that everybody can come to and and advise on what the, what the best way of take going forward is so ultimately my job is to lead our sustainability strategy to do that we've first got to understand where our impacts are um, across the entire business whether that's the ingredients that we buy the products that we make and put on the market the um, factories that we run from an energy perspective, the packaging, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so my team will look after that in terms of where are the impacts. Um, we also then monitor those impacts. We have There's a load of data analysis and spreadsheet work involved in terms of uh, where do the issues sit and how do we report against them? And then obviously we try and improve the impacts that we've identified. So really broad range of project management skills in terms of leading different projects on particular topics of, of interest at the time, whether it's, I don't know, palm oil um, certification or um, soy certification or uh, a packaging element or change or um, energy management within a factory. It's very, very broad brush. Yeah. Um, and Will, I think we've 
a question has come in about how can I spot greenwashing when I'm looking at future employers? And I thought that actually links to, you mentioned about being a B Corp. What are the yep. six and that might be quite nice to bring that to life. Yeah, cool. I, I'm going to come on to B Corp last. I would say yeah. to you, to avoid greenwashing, look at truly what a company is doing. And I'll only talk about us because I don't want to talk about other people. But like at Ella's, we've set our scope one, two and scope three um, carbon targets. So we know exactly where all of our carbon emissions come from across our entire operation, from when we open the front door of our barn to where we source our peas from a farm in Yorkshire, through to where we produce our products in whichever European country it is. And we will happily share that and we'll talk about it. And we know that 25% of our emissions come from packaging, 50% come from the, the foods that we grow. That's making sure that we're sort of saying we are not greenwashing. We know exactly what we're doing and we can talk about the plan. Whereas I think you just need to ask a couple of questions if someone's saying we're brilliant for the environment. What are you doing? And then understand why and take the time and research them. And that way you can avoid greenwashing. An easier way to look at a company is to look at a growing movement, which is called B Corps. I think there are about 2,000 of us in the UK now. Um, and we believe in um, not just delivering profit for our shareholders. We want to have, um, we think about profit, our people, and also the planet. So we have to, we've changed our articles of association, and we now have to report on those three areas and how well we're doing and what we're going to do to continue improving them. There are different ways of finding out, you know, every every business has its benefits. Um, so there are different ways of finding out, you know, what's really happening behind the brand. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. Um, another question that's come in, um, and I, it'd be interesting actually for all of you to answer this is, how did you learn about climate to be able to talk about it in your role? And how are you kind of using that within your own business and teams? Who's going first? Good I mean, me to do that. Yeah, one. go on so, then, Andy. Well, I suppose, I suppose mine's a bit more boring in terms of yeah. I, I studied climate at university, which was a dreadfully long time ago now. Um, but I suppose also um, learning on the job through experience um, and also working with experts. So Will talked about um, scope one, two, three carbon footprint of the organisation. So when, when we're doing that work, um, we quite often, we might well partner with, an external consultancy to help support that. And as you go through that process, there's an on-the-job learning uh, element as to how we achieve that. Yeah. I mean, what is your company doing to reduce kind of carbon emissions? Are you aiming that at me as well? I am as well. So, oh, I right, so <laughs> from a carbon footprint perspective, um, the vast majority, 94%, in fact, is um, in our supply chain. So it's not what the business does directly it's the ingredients that we buy and the products that we place on the market so our strategy is around well how do we engage with our suppliers what are we doing from our own supply perspective but also and i think probably the bigger lever is what are we doing from a product perspective what are the changes that we can make at the product lens through our chefs through our mpd teams to understand what the impacts are of the ingredients that they're specking into products and making changes at that point as well, which obviously involves change from a consumer perspective as well. So what has historically always been sold may not always be sold in future. Yeah. How about you, Carl? How, um, when did you start to connect the dots on food and climate? And I think it was actually that we, um, <clears throat> you know, it took, it, it probably took a lot of um, external people and um, I'm smiling, Kate, because I'm smiling at you. Um, people beating the drum actually and, and really driving it home to us um you know up until probably six years ago before I worked at, at Cranswick I didn't really you know I didn't really appreciate the the things that we were doing and actually the harm we were, we were causing I think you know we've got um, a second nature uh, our, that's our sustainability um arm of the business and actually by being upskilled by the likes of you know yourself Kate and Will um, and having a, a bit of a drive and a bit of passion and <clears throat> understanding the opportunities we've got. Um, it, it's a lot about the, the desire of the, the individual. Um, you know, the way I try and manage it with the guys is I don't ever want to add it into the, the day job. I want those guys to want to do this. I think it's about having a mature team to be able to see beyond the end of the nose and go, actually, this is a, a wider piece of what we're trying to do. Um, but no, 
very similar to Andy, you know, we, we, we work very closely with yourselves and, and other sort of consultancies to try and upskill ourselves. Um, but it's also upskilling the team, you know, the engineering managers, giving them the tools to be able to measure um, how much energy we're using, how much we've saved. It, it creates an excitement around the site, actually, to, to sort of show, look, actually, look what we've done. Have we reduced our carbon footprint? And, you know, what happens when we do get an F gas leak? Where previously, I imagine it was very much just brushed under the carpet. I think it's actually it's a crisis. We report it at a group level, and it goes onto a a, a risk register, which we have to. Um, it's quite uncomfortable actually when you have to report stuff like that. But no, it's it, it's a journey. Um, none of us are experts, and we're learning every single every, you know sort of every day is a, a learning day. But I think the more and more we can get as many people upskilled and 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 actually bring bring experts into our business, and that's hopefully when we can opportunities for the people who have gone and taken you know degrees and, and various bits there's the opportunity to come into our business and, and make a real difference at the minute yeah and will from um your perspective um are you being approached by by a lot of um kind of i guess the next generation the new talent coming through wanting to come and work for you because because of your sustainability credentials yes definitely kate um everyone there's this it never used to be a question in an interview. And it's always a question in an interview now, which shows there's definitely been a shift in terms of yeah. what people expect of a company when they're starting to talk about them. And I think it's a totally fair and valid question and shows genuine interest <laughs> and commitment. And I think that's, you know, I, th I think it's becoming more common and that's great because, you know, going back to what Carl and Andy said, like, I don't know that much about the environment and how to be better, but I've been learning and the best way to do it is by having a conversation. And even before we started this call, we all said we're all still learning and finding out yeah. more. And that's OK. You don't have to know everything. I think what you need is a willingness to want to know and therefore the curiosity to try and find what the next solution is, what the next thing is that we can do together as a team or as a country. Yeah. And Andy, um, obviously you did do a, an environmental and sustainability degree. Um, are you being approached, I would imagine, are you being approached by people asking, how do I get into sustainability? What's your kind of advice? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we there's a couple of people in our team. So we've actually got a, a graduate within my team who um, came over from another discipline and actually um, other people who've transferred from other departments. So we've got someone who was on a, a commercial project background who's come into my team. So um, working in sustainability isn't necessarily about being a absolute world expert in one particular issue. There are other um, roles. We still align off UK that um, every job is a climate job ultimately. So yeah. what, what I don't want to be building an empire that everybody works for me in the sustainability team. I need people in finance, people in technical, um, people in all departments around the organisation that have got a good knowledge of sustainability impact in, in the job that they are doing. Yeah, that we, that's interesting, actually, because we just another question that has come in is around the skills gap. Like, And the question is, I think it's for a university undergrad and postgrad is like, where are, where are you seeing the biggest skills gap, all of you within, within your business to kind of really deliver an impact on climate? Um, Carl, don't know if you want to answer that one. Where's the biggest skills gap? I think the, the biggest skills gap is actually the, the true experts. And I think it's actually being able to, you know, we, very similar to, to Will, we, we understand from our, where our carbon footprint comes from, you know, reality is from, from our, from, from a Cranswick side, it's actually from the feed, you know, the feed that goes into the animals, which we process actually. So from the sites that I'm responsible for, actually, it's a lot about, you know, being provided for, I think from an agricultural side, I think is the opportunity, which we see, you know, and, and people forget that when you, when you show them some of the products that we produce, actually they've got to, be, you know, the animals have got to be reared, they've got to be fed. How do we get the, and I think it's getting the expertise, but it, it's at pace. And it's how do we do it quick enough to be able to make a real change? Because we can always make one or two or three, four nice little looking farms, which do everything. Well, actually, when we've got between 2,000 and 3,000 farms, actually, there's a, there's a hell of a lot. That we see and, and why we set up Future Food Movement was that 
there's a lot of jargon out there around net zero, carbon neutral, you know, net zero carbon. And actually, people don't really understand what it means. And there's a lot of target setting going on. You know, everybody understands where we've got to get to, but they don't really truly understand how to get there. I mean, is that something that, I don't know, Will, you're feeling within your business, that kind of climate literacy? You know, it's, it's such a, a new frontier. Definitely. There's climate literacy and there's also the pace of change. The yeah. minute you think you know something, it's already changed and the way you talk about it isn't the way, you know, it needs to be talked about anymore. So I think, yeah, trying to like demystify it, make some really like solid first steps is really tricky. And then also just keeping abreast with everything that's changing you know, is, is hard. I suppose to build on that as well, okay, that it's not, it's not all technical skills. No, um, yeah. It's, Will alluded to this, that like the pace of change is incredible, which means it's actually really hard to keep up with that unless you are an absolute expert in one tiny little area. Um, what we need more of in this space is generic skills like excellent communicators um people who can lead change people who can um put across a really fantastic business case as to why we should be doing this uh, and just essentially leading in a different way than we have done in the past yeah just to, just, just to build on that from andy like we're working with the government on on a plastics tax at the minute to try and understand what this actually means and they, the government, don't actually know for a variety of reasons, which drives huge amounts of worry back into a company. And what you really need from a person in their is someone to really understand what's in play and be able to present that back to everyone internally and say, this is what I think it means, this is when I think we'll know more, and this is how I think we should behave. And you're like, that's really useful because nobody knows the answers, especially the government. <laughs> So how do you then try and give confidence on something so significant back to a company? And that is a skill, you know, and that's great communication and holding people to account. And yeah. there are two things that we need more of because it's not clear. Yeah. And I think it's actually, you know, there are some incredible scientists and technical experts out there, but actually they're not great communicators. Um, and I think this is a massive cultural shift that we need to see because we need, and I know Andy, we've talked about this, we need everybody to get on board and do a little bit towards it rather than just a few doing a lot. Um, you know, and I think the more people and the more diverse voices and the more people we can encourage to join our industry, the impact that, you know, we, we can have, it would be amazing. I mean, from your perspective, Carl, what, what would, how would you sell the food industry as a career? Like, I think to, if you to sell the food industry, I think it, the opportunities are huge. You know, I'm I'm a prime example of of the opportunity. I think if you are, if you're willing to learn and willing to take advice, you know, there's some great characters within the food industry who could who can teach you a lot. I think take the opportunities. You know, it's not easy work. It's got to be. Um, it's it's not always easy. That is is for sure. But actually, it's very rewarding. We've got a huge opportunity. You know, to leave a legacy of saying, do you know what, when we've We've left the we've left the planet in a better place than we found it, and, and that's where we need to try and get to. And that's you know I'm not saying it's easy, but it's it's being able to empower every single person who works on our business and say, look, if you do your little bit, we're going to do ours. And that's just even people spotting little gas leaks, little leaks here, little water drips, and actually it just becomes part of the day job. It's not a, an extra add-on. It's just it's just the way of life. Yeah. You got anything to add, Andy and Will, on that? Yeah, I could say every company, every retailer, every person in the food industry wants to drive change. Yeah. And I think when you're that one individual or that team who manages to unlock a bit of change that drives a benefit back for the climate, there is no greater reward than that. Yeah. doesn't need to be financial just to know that you've managed to achieve something and what the best thing about it all is there is a desire from everyone to do that so you're you're going with the tide which is great you know we want to do it faster of course but that's a brilliant place to be that the, there are opportunities you just need to find them and then there's willingness to unlock them yeah 
So we just actually had a question in which I'll probably put to you, Andy, um, is given the importance we're all talking about this, having kind of that skill set and that sustainability and, and um, climate mindset, how are you all kind of um, integrating this into your company kind of graduate trainee um, and kind of internal upskilling programs? How are you kind of, I guess, supporting your workforce to become climate smart? Yeah, so we do that from a, a centralised perspective in terms of embedding sustainability thinking into all of our core teams that would have a, uh, an impact on the delivery of our strategy. And we do that um, on a regular basis um, through a, an internal upskilling programme. But I suppose specifically with grads, um, it's a fair challenge, actually. We do um, one of our graduate, pro we've got five different early careers programs of which one of uh we my team specifically take a grad for six months as part of the rotation um which is great for me um and great for the grad in terms of gives them a really good overview of what's involved in sustainability but we can't do that with all grads um unfortunately in terms of the size of our team and, and the impact and the number of grads that we have and i must admit currently on on the broader schemes we don't have a, a sustainability um, module as part of it. What about you, Carla? What how do Cranswick tackle this? I think it's very much, you know what, Kate, if I'm honest, it's very much site led. And ultimately it's about how engaged you can get the, the rest of the business. I think from the sites I've certainly responsible for, we we take it quite seriously and we, you know, we'll use the guys at various. We've got a lot of the, the guys who are carbon literate, which is good. And we've had to go through that to get the, the, the site sort of you know, to that um, carbon neutral stage um, but like I say we don't from a graduate side of it um, we wouldn't have a module at the moment it's very similar to, to Andy but I don't think it's something that's off the page and I think actually it's something that we will be sort of we'll pick up with Katie and understand where we are on, on specifically on that area. Yeah, well that's actually quite a nice segue into I'm just going to, um, I'm conscious of time we've only got I think if I'm right Claire five minutes left is that right? Um, yeah, till one o'clock. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So, I think if I, oh, my screen is not moving, but Andy, so what are the opportunities at Green Corps? So, anyone listening to this call, and obviously all the listen again, um, kind of schools that will be listening to this, if they would like, yeah, I want to go and do Andy's job. I want to go and work for Green Corps. How do they kind of get into your business? Yeah, so in terms of understanding um, what we do and what we're about, greencore.com, always go and check that out. We've got five early careers programmes. Um, there are 99 people um, as part of those total programmes. Currently, um, we've got an engineering apprenticeship programme, degree apprenticeship, finance graduate apprenticeship, a technical graduate apprenticeship, who you'd actually come and work for me for six months if you applied for that. And finally, an IT graduate uh, programme that's starting next year. Okay, excellent. Um, Carl, how about Cranswick? How would they come and work for you guys? Um, I think we've got very, very similar opportunities to, to the guys at Green Corps. Obviously, we've got the apprenticeship programme, uh, the graduate scheme, and then we've got the industry placements. I think the placements are very good to give you guys, you know, for the guys who are on the call who want a, a taster, um, there's an opportunity to come and work for us for sort of 12 months and sort of actually... You know, seeing is believing, getting to the site to understand, would you want a job within food? Um, which then gives you an opportunity to either go one or two ways. You can go into, the, you know, obviously, the, grand, the graduate scheme, um, which we've got three programmes at the moment, which is a, a general graduate scheme or a commercial or even technical. Or then if you don't fancy that, there's actually an apprenticeship scheme, which, you, you know, there's plenty of those which you can learn on the job. Uh, currently, we've got over 180 apprentices on the in the business, um, and we've currently got 72 graduates through various stages of their career so yeah there's lots of opportunities you know cranswick.co.uk <clears throat> give us a call i'm sure that some of the guys will see us at some of the um universities doing the um sort of graduate fairs brilliant and will obviously both well, yourself and i we're in much smaller companies but if somebody mm -hmm. wanted to come and um you know wow i really want to work with you what what would be their route what would you suggest yeah, um, yeah, there's only 92 of us at Ella's Kitchen, so we're a much smaller size. But I would say um, have a look on our website, have a look at what jobs there are available, because they're all up there. Um, have a look at what we do. And if you're really passionate and think that you could bring something, then get in contact.
and it doesn't always work out but you know we had um a guy called charlie who came in and said i'm doing my nvq level two in business and i'd like to come and just do some work placement stuff and we he came in and actually worked on our reception for about two months and that was two and a half years ago so he's now 18 i think he's now maybe 18 and a half and he's a demand planner and i'd say he's about seven years ahead of his competitive set so anyone else but he took the initiative approached us we found something and it worked and it doesn't always come off but it happens and you know now tesco account manager four years ago left university do you know like these things happen it doesn't always happen but ask the question and show genuine curiosity and passion and that's what a lot of us businesses really look for yeah no absolutely um and then yeah from a veris and future food movement perspective we're even smaller there's 18 of us but yeah small but mighty i like to think um but yeah i'm really passionate about um you know supporting people that want to kind of get onto this agenda because it's just so important so we have um an internship program that we run, but we also do these virtual shadow days um, where you can just kind of jump on with us virtually. We do so much online now and you can just kind of shadow different members of the team at different meetings. And, you know, you might get to like sit in a meeting with Andy or Carl. So um, yeah, really open to anyone that would, would be um, interested in that. Um, that's it, I think we're, yeah, just about on time, Claire. Um, so yeah, over to you with kind of how we wrap up. Thank you very much indeed. And I think um, absolutely for the young people who are on, on the call today or indeed will pick up this um, via the recording, I think the clear message is about just making new things happen um, and raising that curiosity and following that curiosity. Um, and I'm sure everyone on the call here would be more than happy if there are any questions that come up later or that follow the recording, um, that we can pass these on to our um, great start here today, um, as long and, uh, along with all the, the links to the opportunities um, for the early careers, the entry level roles, the apprenticeships and so on, so we can get more information out to them as well. Um, if you are watching, this is a, um, a code QR code to the feedback sheet. Um, any of your feedback is absolutely invaluable to us. There's also a link there available to go onto the Slido feedback form. Uh, we will collate that and then use that to improve our um, production and our resources. Um, and we'll also share that with our colleagues today so they get a, a great insight um, into the thoughts again of the young people. Um, the recording itself can be found um, in a few days time on the Working Options website. So it will be there on our student zone as part of our resources then, so you can access it there and obviously look again at your leisure. But in the meantime, um, I hope that this has raised curiosity and has absolutely um, got you thinking about a career um, in the food industry and actually how you can make a change um, by doing that. And I think everyone here will, will absolutely um, you know, follow the idea that the, the talent pool of young people out there has, has got a huge array of um, ambitious young people that just need you know the, the the raising awareness element that's been uh, given today so thank you so much thank you kate for leading the session thank you everyone else for joining and um yeah we'll we'll put an end to the recording there and we'll be in touch with everyone soon with our next class so thank you very much indeed thanks guys thanks guys thank, thank you bye